Hi, everyone, and welcome to the third week of the Arab Oil and Gas Academy internship. My name is Nihal Munir, and I'll be your moderator for the day. So I want you guys to listen to what I'm going to say right now because it's very important. Uh, throughout the presentation, uh, Engineer Isa will have three questions for you that you need to answer. I will be collecting these answers. So if you please, when he asks these three questions, leave your answers in the chat box, right? So his questions, you answer them in the chat box. Your questions, you will leave them in the Q&A part of Facebook Live. So nothing is mixed up and I'll be able to filter things out and ask him your questions. So again, your questions in the Q&A box and his question in the chat box. Got it? Cool. So welcome and let me introduce our speaker for today. Our speaker is uh, engineer Isa Haddad. Uh, Isa Haddad is an acoustics and geomechanics petrophysicist in Schlumberger Houston Data Service Center. His work includes anisotropic characterization and 3D mechanical properties interpretation and unconventional, uh, unconventional and conventional basins. He graduated from Texas Tech University with a master's and bachelor's degree from uh, University of Al Bath in petroleum engineering. He is currently pursuing a master's degree in data science and analytics from University of Oklahoma. Uh, Engineer Isa, over to you. Uh, thank you, Nihal. Appreciate the introduction. Uh, before we start, I want to thank Marietta College, Dr. Ahmed Al Jarhi, SPE Egypt chapter, uh, for the invitation. And I want to thank, uh, thank all of my uh, colleagues and uh, engineers and geoscientists for joining us today. Uh, my name is Isa Haddad and I am a petrophysicist with Schlumberger. Our agenda will today for today will be mechanical earth model definition and workflow. Why do we need mechanical earth model? Then we will dive into overboarding computations, fluid pressure calculations, uh, elastic properties, rock strength, stress magnitude, stress direction. And we if we have time, I would like to show you one DMAM demo, even though I'm showing um, the results for each perspective, part of the MEM as we go on. So it's just gonna be a, a summation in one uh, straight way. And finally, we'll wrap it up with a Q and A session to hopefully answer all uh, your questions. So for the MEM, what is the MEM? The MEM is a collection of, uh, of properties that belong to the rock. Those are elastic properties, rock strength, uh, stresses that are governing uh, the basin that we work with. Based on what we want to do on how many dimensions we want to go, the, MEA, the MEM can be one dimension up to four dimensions. If we decide to work with a one dimension MEM, we will need mechanical stratigraphy to divide the rock between uh, grain supported and shale supported. If we want to go with a more complex 2D or 3D uh, type of MEM, then we will need to have a full geological model uh, that will describe the faults, the uncertainty, the conformity, the type of uh, salt dome, and any, any, any part of uh, the structure that we cannot cover in one DMEM. Uh, our end answer will be elastic properties, strength, stresses, and of course, other than the stresses magnitudes, we'll have the stress direction because it's very important to have the stress direction in order for us to drill and complete uh, wells and stimulate them. Uh, what is our workflow? Our workflow, of course, would depend on what we are trying to do. So if we are doing one DMEM, it will be using well logs. So for that, we will try to get as much uh, core data as we have or we can uh, we can use. Uh, also uh, from the drilling folks we try to get all the drilling reports, all the drilling incidents, did they have loss of circulation, did they have a fluid uh, coming into the borehole as they drill, uh, of course depending on the type of drilling as well and most importantly is our well logs because that's what that is the essence of, uh, apply, of building the mechanical earth model 
including bulk density, resistivities in the compression and shear slownesses, uh, among others. From there, depending as well as where we want to go, do we want it to keep it simple? We can, uh, if we're in 1D MEM, we cannot really relate to false. We cannot really uh, account for unconformity. So we will, can only divide our rock at the, either shale or sand, or we can have an elemental analysis that describes our, um, our rock components. Uh, but again, we cannot, uh, in the framework model, we cannot really uh, add the fault. We have to add it in more of 3D reservoir geomechanics. The next step would be the overboarding stress from the log integration, the density log integration, and then the pore pressure, the pore pressure determination. Once we have those, we can start, we can move to the next step, which is the mechanical property and the elastic property calculations. Uh, and then stress direction. It's very important to know what is the direction of our minimum horizontal stress, maximum horizontal stress, along with our stress regime, because stress order in magnitude differs on the different areas of the, of the earth and different bases. Once we have the directions, the magnitude, we can start taking our result to the next step, which is based on your type, based on, of course, on the application, we can go with wellbore stability, we can do fracture analysis, we can do sand analysis, sanding analysis, and so on. The only step that I see missing in this slide is we have to revise as we add more data, as we drill more, as we know more, we have to revise and add more constraint to our model. So our model is uh, more representative and can help us predict uh, incidents in the future and hopefully prevent them if they are not in our favor. And any mechanical earth model is as good as the calibration. I can take uh, any logs that I have and build an entire earth model within 10 minutes. That is worthless if I don't have good calibration point that are coming from core to really represent uh, what we have as a challenge. I will show you some example as we move on uh, uh, exactly what I mean in this, in this uh, sentence. So why do we need MEM? Uh, this is a very famous uh, picture from uh, Ecofesc uh, platform. It had uh, so it has synced, as you can see, as the water keep increasing as the well, uh, as the, the several wells that are uh, drilled from this platform are producing. The reason why uh, this happened, that there was no, uh, not enough, not enough um, work done on the geomechanics and uh, the subsidence has happened and, and, and this most likely ended up to cost the operator so much money either to fix the problem or just to abandon the rig and move on. To answer where we can use the geomechanics in this uh, graph, I'm showing you that the geomechanics or the MEM is very important from the moment we put the rig, from the moment we put the rig and we start drilling. Here we need to know the pore pressure, we need to know to design our mud. As we move on with the drilling, and we start thinking of deviation, we would need to know the plane of weakness. And the plane of weakness will help us determine if our rock will collapse or not based on the angle of drilling and also the relative dip of those formations that we're gonna go through. Also, the geomechanics uh, engineer will be responsible on the determining uh, whether we, will, we may face any loss of circulation events or well stability events. Once we reach our oil we, uh, or our reservoir, uh, the geomechanics engineer will design the most suitable stimulation process and make sure that this, um, and, and once production starts, that our completion design is gonna withstand any possible problems such as sanding or subsidence, uh, or whether if we're in stimulating, if we're still in the stimulation phase, if we are gonna uh, affect the cap rock and uh, hopefully not to, uh, to break it. So we are working on preventing the cap rock uh, breaking or even sometimes water production. So the geomechanics engineer unfortunately does not contribute to 
two important answers when it comes to the oil industry. Those answers are how much oil and where is the oil. We don't contribute to that. But what we, what we contribute to is how to get there and how to get there safely, which is the most important part, and hopefully not losing money by having unplanned events during drilling that can cost money and sometimes even lives. So that's our role as geomechanics engineers, and um, it's very important and um, sometimes underestimated. So uh, here I started with just basic uh, definitions for stress and strain. So as you can see from the graph, the stress that we have here is just the load divided by the area, and that will be the stress. Stresses can be divided into normal stresses and shear stresses. If we are going to include both normal and shear stresses, our uh, stress matrix will be very complex. And usually, geomechanics work is not uh, very simple. So adding complexity to the problem does not really help us moving on. Luckily, on the, any point of Earth, we can use three stresses only. That's what we call the principal stresses. By knowing their magnitude and knowing their direction, we are able to solve most of our geomechanical, prob uh, geomechanical problems and achieve our goals. Those stresses are uh, either called vertical stress, maximum and minimum horizontal stress, or called sigma one, sigma two, sigma three. Their direction uh, for minimum and maximum horizontal stress, they are perpendicular. Their magnitude is totally independent from each other. And um, the order of their magnitudes also can be uh, different. So vertical stress in a normal stress regime, it's the maximum stress in terms of magnitude. As the stress regime change from normal to fault to strike slip, the order is changing. And that's something we need to keep in mind when we are working. We do not want to make the assumption that the vertical stress is always uh, the biggest stress in terms of magnitude. Uh, the strain is how much the material uh, dimensions are changing when we are applying stress. So if we are comprising, co applying compression on a sample, we'd expect the sample to shorten uh, long, on the long, in the direction of the compression and the width of the sample will increase. So in this case, we will have two strains, one in the L direction, one in the W direction, and the strain is pretty much the, just a change of this dimension. So let's dive into the overboarding and pore pressure computations. Uh, the overboarding in a very short, sweet manner is just the weight of the rock and fluid at any depth, the overlaying rock and fluid weight. So if we are at this point, the overboarding, here where I'm hovering the mouse, the overboarding will be the integration of the density from this point up to the surface, including both the rock and the fluid that is contained in the rock. Uh, when we are working with overboarding, it's always needed, we always need to refer to the TV true vertical depth. We cannot compute the overboarding using measured depths as our well can be deviated and can be horizontal and so on. So when we are working with the gradients in general, not only pressure, but also even temperature and all kinds of gradients, we want always the true vertical thickness. And if there is water on top of this, if we are working in an offshore environment, then we will need also to account for that by assigning the proper depth for the water and the proper density. Otherwise, we would be, um, we would be uh, overestimating or underestimating or overboarded stress. Uh, the computation of the overboarding stress is very, very simple. We can, we have a density log that is squared in a wireline acquisition. Usually density logs do not extend to the top of the, because most, most operators do not record any logs in the surface drilling phase, only in intermediate and, uh, and, uh, and final or uh, only the TD section sometimes. So, if you're lucky, you will get it for the most part. Not, it's not a big problem. So here, as you can see, we first extrapolated, extrapolated to almost the surface, 
with what we think is the surface density, which is, if you are onshore, 2.2 will be a decent, uh, a decent starting point. If you are offshore, it will be 1.8, 1.7, because the water depth above you will help decrease this uh, density. Above it, you can see we have some empty space with no density that is just because we are uh, accounting also for uh, the height of the drilling rig. And here we don't have any density from the air acting on us. From there, we just extrapolate to the surface and then we integrate, uh, we integrate, the, the, we integrate the, the density over this entire depth interval and multiply it by the gravitational acceleration constant. And that is pretty much our vertical stress. As simple as this might uh, look, and it is pretty simple to compute, of course, this is the most uh, famous method, the extrapolation method, and all other methods like Amico, and uh, there are so many of them, they're just derivative of it, and they both all use the bulk density. Uh, as simple as this is, it, I wouldn't uh, be very confident unless I consult with an expert in the region that has a very good knowledge of what is the expected overboarding gradient and overboarding stress in this region. Uh, recently, in a project that I was working on, I uh, was uh, working in the Gulf of Mexico, and uh, uh, my final vertical stress gradient came to be 0 0.75. And when I consulted with my principal, Jimmy Mechanics engineer, he said it's too low, and having a low overboard in stress can really change the relationship between the stresses, as we can be moving from one stress regime to another if we do not have it properly. So what I'm trying to say, have a local experience uh, because, you know, Jimmy Mechanics Engineer, it's based on science, experience, and best judgment. You cannot really take one Jimmy Mechanics Engineer from one region and put him to another and expect him to work and deliver the most because he doesn't have uh, yet all the information he needs, which is the experience in this case. Uh, moving on to the pore pressure. If we want to define the pore pressure is the pressure that is practiced by the fluid flow filling the pores on the rock grains. It is supporting the rock grains. Uh, and this definition works very well for, uh, for porous rock, for permeable rocks such as sandstone, limestone, and so on. Uh, but if we are in a shale, the shale pores are very small. There is also the chemical interaction between inside the between the water and the clay uh, like clay component the presence of the bound water that is surrounding uh, that is surrounding the clay uh, uh, mineral and so on make it very difficult very very difficult to determine the pore pressure I recently worked with a client who uh, had to stabilize the the, the get a decent pore pressure value in a, in a clay formation, you had to stabilize uh, the pressure for about a month with a variation of one PSI up or down in order for him to have a good sense of what is a good pore pressure. So why is it important to know the pore pressure? That will be my first question to you. Probably we have answered before. But why we really, um, care about knowing the pore pressure. Nihal, am I expecting the answers or it will be later? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at it right now. Thank you. So, okay, um, to determine mud weight when drilling, to That's calculate mud weight properly, to choose the appropriate mud because of the overburden pressure, to have proper design of mud density. That's yeah, good. pretty much that's everyone is first, uh, it's, it's, from okay, Good, that's, that's good that uh, we are on the same page. So yeah, we, uh, if we are drilling blindly, thank you all for your answers and thank you, Nihal. Uh, so if we're drilling, drilling blindly, uh, we may um, be, uh, we, our drilling mud will be, could be less than the pore pressure and then we will have fluid entry and a possible kick and a blowout. On the other hand, if we are, if our mud is way higher than uh, the, the pore pressure, then in this case, 
uh, we may frag the formation and we have fluid loss and eventually fluid will come back and also we'll have uh, bus uh, kick and blow up. So it's very important that based on the type of drilling we're doing over, um, uh, if we are over balanced or under balanced, it's very important to know uh, the pore pressure in order for us to uh, drill safely. That's the most important part. And also to be drilled efficiently. Uh, because the, the, if we want to keep a really large overbalance, which is pore pressure minus um, minus uh, the, I'm, I'm sorry, the mud weight is, is the, the difference between the pore pressure and the mud weight. If we want to keep this difference is huge, then we will end up with a very uh, poor drilling uh, performance that will be drilling very slowly and that's not optimal, very low rate of penetration. So determining the pore pressure is uh, it's not easy task, but it can be done uh, using several methods. Uh, of course, we'll try always to include our calibration points. We always need to reach out to our drilling folks. Uh, if we are in an operation or we try to, uh, to our service company like Schlumberger and others, uh, we would write to reach to the client and try to get as much information as we can from the drilling report and what incidents happen and try to make sense of it in terms of pore pressure. Uh, the most famous methods to determine the pore pressure is Eaton method. It's a graphical method. Uh, it, based, it works on the um, uh, trend line concept that I will explain in a second. And the other one is uh, Bowers that is based on equation. So in start with the Eaton, we first establish what we think is a normal trend for compaction in shales. Why in shales? Because shales allows us due to the compaction nature of the rock and uh, the reduction of porosity as the rock is buried deeper and deeper, it can, with empirical correlation, we can, um, we can establish um, a pore pressure empirical correlations that, determine, that help us determine it in the shale, as we cannot do it in a porous rock. We can measure on a, the pore pressure in a porous rock, but we, uh, we cannot do it in shale, but we can model it in shale. And Edom method is one of those empirical modeling uh, techniques. So we draw first what we think is the, the, the natural compaction trend, that, we're, that means we're excluding overpressure or under pressure formations. And then we look at specific properties that are affected by the compaction, such as the most used one is the compressional slowness. The other one is the resistivity. Sometimes people use seismic uh, rate of penetration and so on. We look at, at any depth we are interested in knowing the pore pressure. We look at the value of that property. And then we compare that value with a normal trend. And once, uh, and then from there we see where that, where that value on the normal trend belong. Is it over pressure, under pressure, and so on? Is it over, more, in, in, in other words, is it higher or lower than the normal trend that we draw? Uh, once we have that, we can compute that pressure based on the correlation that I just, uh, the, that is uh, displayed here and the difference between the normal trend of the pressure and the, the property, in this case, the compressional slowness, and what we are seeing at a certain depth. Uh, here is an example of Eaton method. I'm using pretty much all the, all the, uh, the default parameters. And I would go with you with what you're seeing here on the very first track, we have true vertical depth, then zonation, it's something disregard has no meaning for our work here. Then first, using gamma ray, I'm separating my rock because I can't compute the pore pressure over the entire rock interval. I only can compute it in shales. So I'm separating my rock as a shale, non-shale, simply just drawing a line that separates this rock. And in the shale formation, I'm drawing using the compressional slowness, I'm drawing also a trend line. This trend line uh, represents the natural compaction that we are expecting to see if we don't have an overpressure zone or under pressure zone. Uh, this is on a semi-log should be almost vertical line. We try to tilt it toward more of a faster formation in this, in this particular case from right to left, just to honor how the rock becomes stiffer with depth. That's a very valid assumption to make as the rock is 
getting going to be stiffer as it's uh, more more uh, uh, sedimentation happen on the top of it that is pushing it down more weight applied fluid are escaping and it, the rock becomes stiffer so this is why you can see that my trend line here is a little tilted and on the next track is what I see the normalization, what is the normal pore pressure would be, and then what is the pore pressure at any depth should be. And here at the very top in red, I'm showing you the core pore pressure. We're lucky to have several MDT. So as I mentioned, we can only compute the pore pressure in shales. So in the non-shale formation here in those uh, very thin sands and sometimes can be very thick. What, what do we do? Do we leave it empty or uh, what do we do? Uh, pretty much we can use, uh, we can uh, extrapolate here or interpolate in this case. Uh, we can use a constant, uh, constant value for this pressure or we can leave it empty if we don't, if we don't know better. But the best, best thing to do is, uh, as you can see, they are only coming in a, sh in a sand formation is, uh, or this is the optimum situation where we have an actual MDT taken, where we use pressure transducer to measure this uh, pore pressure or the formation pressure for us. Those will be our calibration point. Uh, again, um, it's very, what I think is a draw, drawback of this method is it's a graphical. We draw things differently. So there will be an issue with repeating the results for us. So if I draw something, you will draw it differently and we'll end up with a different pressure. Uh, I wouldn't, it's the easiest method to use. It's mostly used in the industry, but, and it will help you guys if you have a chance to play with it, uh, is to help you to understand the correlation between the normal compaction and the pore pressure. With that being said, I don't recommend using it if I don't have actual validation points that are coming from the drilling reports or coming from uh, uh, from pressure testing. In this case, I probably went too severe on the tilting the, the line. It should be less than this, but I was trying uh, to fit most of my calibration point. Those are the ground truth for me in this case. To overcome the drawbacks that I mentioned for the ATEM method, uh, Bauer's method, it's an equation based. Uh, it uses the power law equation, as you can see here, and I'm, I'm providing you with the default values. And it uh, uses either slowness or uh, slowness or velocity, which is the velocity is the opposite of the slowness. It's one over uh, the slowness. And here I using the same example, using the same calibration points and only using the, um, uh, the default parameters. I had a pretty good match actually. They overlay both Eaton and uh, Bowers they overlay and they match my pore pressure very well for the most part. They're not going to match every point. That's uh, science fiction. It doesn't happen. Uh, so from here, I'm very confident that this pore pressure should be something I trust as I go on for my uh, stress uh, computations and uh, further analysis. Moving on to elastic properties. First, uh, let's define elasticity. Elasticity is the ability of the, an element to go back to its original shape and dimension after a force has been removed. When we are working uh, with the rock, uh, the elasticity is not the only behavior we see. So the rock is elastic only for a small range of force applied. After this range is ex exceeded, the rock will break and we'll move to plasticity uh, concept. When we are describing the elasticity of rock, if the, our rock is isotropic, we'll be using uh, two uh, independent modulus, Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. Uh, if we are in an isotropic rock, that means the property direction, the property change as the direction change, we will have two Young's modulus and two Poisson's ratio in both vertical and horizontal direction. And moving from isotropic assumption to anisotropic is one of the things we do to honor the complexity of the situation, but also it makes our job very, very difficult. But oversimplifying the model does not help solve a complex issue, always. We will need to honor the complexity and uh, as we move on. 
So uh, I like to introduce the dynamic elastic properties. So when we are taking, when we are doing um, a wireline acquisition, we get compressional slowness, we get shear slowness, bulk density, and those are ascribed at very high speed, 300 to probably 1500 uh, feet per hour. The sampling rate is very small. We're looking at 0 0.5 uh, foot. Uh, that is how many measurement we get. We all get the measurement of bulk density every half foot or uh, the density and compressional slowness for other measurements even less. Um, from those, we use um, the we uh, we use them to do, we use those outputs from the wireline acquisition to compute our dynamic shear modulus. Shear modulus is what we define the material resistance to change in its shape. No change in the volume; it's only the shape of the material that is changing. And uh, the definition of the of the shear modulus is the bulk density divided by the shear slowness uh, squared. I added the compressional factor, um, uh, the convergent factor, I apologize, because I'm uh, using gram per cc for my um, bulk density and microsecond per foot for my, uh, my shear slowness. This number will vary, so don't stick to it and try to Google. If you're using a commercial software, it will automatically does will automatically do the conversion for you. But if you're using it in Excel, uh, which is totally fine, then just make sure you're using the proper conversion factor to get meaningful results. Uh, the next uh, modulus that we need to, uh, for the computing Young's and Poisson's ratio is the bulk modulus. And also in a nutshell, it is just, um, uh, it is describing uh, the material or the rock resistance to change over its value. When we are compress compressing the rock, the volume will be reduced and the dynamic bulk modulus as a, as a magnitude describes this change or the resistance of this change. And it's a correlation between bulk density, compressional slowness, and the shear, uh, shear modulus. Uh, the other two uh, dynamic uh, properties are Young's modulus. Young's modulus is one of the very important ones. Uh, and it describes, it's, it's defined as the, um, uh, as the ratio of the stress applied uh, to the strain that is generated due to the, that stress in the same direction. So if we, uh, let, let me uh, show you here, if we are applying a force, uh, a compressional force, then the, the length will be reduced and the width will be increasing. So when we are defining Young's modulus, Young's modulus is if we are in a lab condition, it's gonna be the force or the stress that is applied, which is the load over the, over the length. And we're then we're dividing it by uh, the change in length, how much the material shrank to do that applied uh, a stress that is in lab environment, this is how would we compute the Young's modulus. But since we are using uh, logs and we are not actually applying much of force on, on the rock in the borehole, uh, it's just small pulses coming from the shear and compressional uh, measurements, the waveforms. So we will define it using this empirical correlation, which is pretty much just an equa equation uh, between the Young's modulus and the derivatives of bulk density and, uh, and then both in compressional and shear slownesses. And they are in the form of uh, shear modulus and bulk modulus. Poisson's ratio is um, how much, if we're looking back to this sample, is how much our rock gaining width as the shrinking happen in, in the length direction. So this is how would we measure it in lab condition. And again, in the same um, manner, how would we get it from, uh, wire, from wireline logs, from bulk density and slownesses, both compressional and shear. Uh, the correlation between Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio is transfers correlation. Uh, the stiffer the rock, the more competent the rock, the harder to break. It will have a higher Young's modulus and a lower Poisson's. And the opposite for incompetent rock, for example, if you are in shale, probably you have very, if you are in a, in a competent uh, limestone, you will have a very high Young's modulus and very low 
uh, Poisson's ratio, and the opposite will be the initial information. So now we had what we need to go further. But first, if we have, uh, if we have, uh, if we want to calibrate our work to core, we need to convert from dynamic to static. And dynamic moduli is always higher. So we need to account for that. And uh, we account to that by using different convergence based on the property that we're trying to convert, whether if it's Young's modulus or uh, Poisson's ratio, you really either assume as static equal to dynamic, uh, or if we are looking at, um, if we are looking at, um, let's say the uh, shear modulus, there is correlation for it, and also uh, for the bulk modulus, and I'll provide that in a sec. And the main reason why we're doing that, again, is because the strings that are applied by the tool in the borehole are a lot smaller than what we expect in the lab. Also, the frequency, we're measuring that on very high speed and also on very small interval. Again, we're doing this over a half foot of instead of an entire or a, a core sample. So here I provided you with the most used correlations for Young's modulus uh, conversion from stat dynamic to static. I uh, put the method, the equation, the inputs, the suitability, and the conditions where we can apply it and where not if there's any condition to apply. Um, uh, I would, uh, with either one of those, I would proceed with caution and I would proceed with a checking expert, a knowledgeable engineer in the region, and of course the ground truth that is core if we have any, because as you will see, it's that, that common that you'll have a lot of core. Poisson's ratio, it, it's assumed that dynamic is equal to static. And if, if uh, your core is saying differently, you can always use a multiplier. If you think that you're overestimating or underestimating Poisson's ratio, you can multiply it by a small number just to make sure that you're getting it right. And then once we have uh, the Poisson's ratio in Young's modulus, then we can back compute the static bulk, uh, the static bulk and the shear moduli as you can see as an equation uh, includes uh, the Poisson's ratio static and the uh, Young's modulus static that is applying for both. For the rock strength, uh, the rock strength, we will talk about the unconfined compressive strength, the tensile strength, friction angle, and uh, those are the most important ones to our work. Uh, the UCS is defined as the maximum strength that a rock has before it breaks under compression if this rock is not supported. So as you can see here, we have a rock sample that is broken. This is 45 degrees pretty much. This is very common uh, angle for the rock to break according to. And we can, you can see that the cylinder, uh, steel cylinder is applying the weight from the top and there is no confinement. If we confine this uh, sample, this core sample, then it will take longer for the rock to break. But since it was not confined, it broke at a lower UCS. The UCS is crucial when it comes to wellbore stability. It is uh, very important that you have it calibrated. And it is very important that um, you have a good, uh, good confident sense in your, in your UCS, your confined compressive strength. Here I'm uh, putting uh, some of the famous equations that uh, are provided in the industry for the unconfined compressive strengths, either using pressure slowness or the modulars that we talked about, and also where we can use them. And even though, and there are others, you know, there you can come up with your own equation if you have enough core uh, uh, as well. It's not that uh, common, it's not that difficult, and it's, uh, it's very common, because usually when someone come up with an equation, he's not using that many cores anyway. He's using 50, 100, but with a, it's a small number if you're working in a large reservoir or a large basin. So here I wanted to show you how important is our core calibration in this example. Here I came to compute the UCS using a, a method. I don't even remember what it was. And when I drop my UCS coming from core, you can see how they're matching pretty well. Do I have a high confident? No, I don't. I have only two dots to calibrate to. I have two points of core. So there's a lot of uncertainty. We're covering four or 5,000 feet. I would really like to have more, 
but uh, it is what it is. That's, that's the only thing that we have, but yet still better than nothing. Now, I wanna show you how would you proceed if you do not have those core values. So what looks here, very incompetent rock, as you can see, the UCS is very long for the most part. I mean, it can cause so many problems in the world war stability domain. Can be a very, very competent rock based on the equation you use. And we tend to believe numbers, but numbers are not always the truth. Here in the pink dots, I'm showing you those calibration points and please disregard the mess. Those are just different equations. What, 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 what is a really incompetent rock can be a very hard to uh, break rock, which is not the truth based on the equation that we're using. And by the way, all those equations were used with default parameters. Why they failed? They failed because they're not applicable. We are not in the proper, this equation is made for a certain range of porosity, certain range of Poisson's ratio, certain type of rock. If we are not honoring that, we cannot use it. It will lead us to having a very poor results. And here I'm showing you two, two equations that, uh, that provided to you, or you can even Google them very, very, um, uh, very fast and fine. So in the top, the top cross plot, we're plotting the Young's, the static Young's modulus versus the UCS. And you can see their relationship is not linear. And the dots are all over, all over the, the plot. We would like to think we are here on this line that is representing our, uh, our uh, computations, our results. But there's a very good chance that we are here and we are way for our UCS is way less than what we expected. The same applies here with a huge spread of UCS versus porosity. What you think, what we would like to be on the line could be way less or way higher. So we end up with a rock that is incompetent and or harder to, uh, to break. So please keep this piece of, an, uh, piece of information in your mind whenever you're doing geomechanics because uh, running equations is the easiest thing, making sense of them is uh, very important. The tensile strength is how much a material can resist pulling. And we don't have much of pulling in the earth, earth structure and the, the, the rock in general is, can withhold a lot of compression, but very little of tensile strength. There are several equations and the most common one is just a multiplier of the UCS as a tensile strength is equal to 0.1 multiplied by the, U, the UCS. If you have core, you would always try to calibrate to it as well and, uh, and you can change this multiplier to, uh, to uh, you will first investigate your UCS and then you will change the multiplier to reflect the proper uh, fitting. Here we're showing, uh, talking about the friction angle. Friction angle is a measure of the ability of a unit of rock to resist uh, or to with, withstand a shear stress. So how much my rock will resist changing in shape, moving, not changing in volume. Uh, the, there are several equations as well. The most basic and seems to be working uh, very well is the one with a gamma ray where you, will pretty much give a value in a, define your, your Shaley zone, assign it a value of friction angle equal to 18 to 20. And that is low uh, incompetent rock. Or if you're in sand, you will give it a value of 35 to 38. And um, then the method will pretty much, the equation will interpolate based on your gamma ray value, what is your friction angle. Now we're moving to the elephant in the room, is defining the minimum and maximum horizontal stress magnitudes. If you notice I changed the order in the presentation uh, agenda uh, or in the workflow, we talk about the direction and then the magnitudes. But since we're talking already qu quantitative uh, approaches and equations, I wanna finish with equations and then we jump to the qualitative approaches to define this, the stress. Uh, direction. So we will go with maximum for the direction with the magnitude first, and then we will uh, will address the 
uh, direction dilemma and difficulty. So the minimum horizontal stress, we can measure it. That's the good thing. We can measure it from a leak off test. Uh, we can measure it from micro hydro fracture test, from uh, step rate test, or we can also infer it in direct way, most importantly from drilling records. If, um, if, uh, if the drilling crew has reported any losses, that means they frack the formation and the, the pressure in the well bore exceeded the minimum horizontal stress. So whether we have losses, that is very good indicator. And uh, we have to spend a lot of time digging in those drilling reports and trying to get as much as we can for us to constrain our uh, minimum horizontal stress uh, magnitude. On the other hand, the, the maximum horizontal stress, we do not have any direct method to measure it. So we infer the, the, the maximum horizontal stress based on different model, based on more Coulomb or a photoelastic model, or if you guys ever taken that um, the Stanford geomechanics course, he used totally different approach as well. There are so many, uh, so many, so many approaches to refer to the maximum horizontal stress value, but it is not no direct measurement for it. Sometimes we can, uh, from sonic scanner in Bergen, where we try to see how much, based on the velocities or the slownesses, how much change uh, happened near the well bore as the, the, as the tool uh, sends both short wave and long wave and uh, can be the depth of investigation, uh, can help us uh, determine the, the, the ratio of change of uh, stress and then invert that and try to get a value of it. Uh, among other men, modeling is a one, one technique, simulation is another technique, and so on. But again, it's no direct measurement. This is, uh, this is the, the biggest answer that um, your boss will be expecting from you as geomechanics engineer after a good, a good amount of work in the data integration from different sources, images, uh, sonic seismic, and so on. Uh, so more cool um, uh, model, it's, uh, I've used it several times. Uh, as you can see in those equations here for the minimum maximum horizontal stress, it's just a correlation between vertical stress, vertical pressure, the friction angle. And as we pass the line in more cool um, very famous cir uh, circle, we pass the line between, uh, the, the line is a correlation between normal stress and, uh, and shear stress. As we pass the line, the rock will fail or the material will tend to fail. And the line is controlled by pore pressure and most importantly by the cohesion and the friction angle. Uh, you will get value most of the time that makes sense on the very safe side for the minimum horizontal stress from more Coulomb, but you're not gonna get a good representative value of the maximum horizontal stress. So if you are in a stress regime, a normal stress regime, the order of stress magnitude will be vertical stress is the largest, then the maximum horizontal stress, then the minimum horizontal stress. Try, and you know that for certain, you know for sure that I am in a normal stress regime. Applying more Coulomb may give you a different answer. I give you the maximum horizontal stress is way larger than your vertical stress, which is totally wrong. But for more Coulomb, I suggest that when you are running blind with no uh, defect test or leak off test or whatever test that we use for determining the minimum horizontal stress, I suggest you come here because the minimum horizontal stress value that you get out of it is on the safe side. And that's very important if you're planning drilling events. So you wanna make sure that you are not breaking that formation and causing losses so it's okay to come here and use it and say, hey guys, this is my minimum horizontal stress, uh, just to stay safe. The other module or the other uh, well-known and uh, well-used method to, to compute the stresses are the photoelastic method. And out of this, you will get very reasonable results from both, uh, for both the minimum and the, horizontal, the maximum horizontal stress. Uh, the method, is as you can see, it's a correlation between Poisson's ratio, the vertical stress, the uh, void coefficient, pore pressure. Void coefficient is a function of uh, porosity, the skeleton of the rock. Uh, some people think it's constant, it is definitely not. 
And some people think if there's one value, even your rock is isotropic, anisotropic. That's also not correct. Fluid coefficient can be both vertical and horizontal as well. They're all paper in progress. It will be published soon by one of our colleagues describing this problem. And there's very few dots or very few core done uh, for alpha uh, coefficient, but it's definitely not constant. And it is a function of the porosity in a nonlinear manner. And it is just showing you like if a higher porosity rock then uh, uh, the pore pressure will be acting more if you are in very low porosity then it will be acting less. Here, uh, other than what uh, I mentioned, we have the strains, the, um, uh, the horizontal, the minimum horizontal strain and maximum horizontal strain, sometimes referred to as uh, epsilon X or epsilon and epsilon Y. Uh, those are to honor the tectonics that uh, you are working with as well. And they're very important to, uh, to add. The value of the strains are very, very small. A good rule of thumb for them, the, the, max, the epsilon H capital will be uh, 0 0.0003. And for the, for the epsilon H uh, small letter will be 0 0.00005, even though it's a very small uh, magnitude, but this is probably if you have calibrated everything else, Poisson's, uh, Poisson's ratio, uh, Young's modulus and your pore pressure, those are the only source of uncertainty you have in this case. Uh, and you will calibrate them properly by comparing your output sigma H or the minimum horizontal stress to a defit. And then uh, that you will have a better, uh, better um, confidence in your maximum horizontal stress. Now this is a long equation, if you agree with me, but this is a, for isotropic rock. This is taking into account that any property is the same in all directions. If we have isotropic, an isotropic rock, which is most shales, uh, or due to the bedding, the intrinsic bedding of the rock, then you will have two Poissons, one vertical, one horizontal, and uh, two Young's modulus. So the equation will get even uh, longer, and it will be uh, a little harder to solve, and uh, you will need to include advanced uh, work on the on the acoustic side uh, specifically. So now we determined our stresses. We determined we started from the poor from the overboarding. We then went to the poor pressure. We computed the elastic properties, and then we computed the rock strains. And finally, we had good values. We think for minimum and maximum horizontal stress. As this is all good and very important, but we need to determine the direction of the stress. This is very important for the drilling program, the direction of the drilling, the kickoff point, how, where do you want to place that lateral? Where do you want to drill to frack? If you are working unconventional, you are planning to frack, it's very important that you know exactly how, in what direction you're putting your lateral and what direction. So you know where, where your frack is uh, gonna propagate. For, the, for this reason, we uh, the stress direction determination as uh, it's it's a it's a collaborative approach. You get data from images, you get data from local knowledge, you get data from calibers, from sonic scanner, uh, and you try to make your best judgment. Sometimes by collecting all this data based on the well deviation, uh, you will try. For, for example, knowing the direction of stresses in vertical well is uh, Straightforward if you have what, what it takes. If you have images, you have induced fractures, you have breakouts, you're good. Uh, if you have laterals, on the other hand, or you're working in a salt dome, then that, that's a totally different case. And I will, I will have a slide that explaining what I'm talking about. So we can, uh, as you can see here, we can use caliber and image analysis to determine the stress. How does that work? In any vertical or sub-vertical well where we have the deviation is less than 15 degrees, and we have breakouts that we detected either on caliber, oriented calibers, or on images. Those, those, those breakouts are in the direction of the minimum horizontal stress. This is, has been improved. There are so many publications, and we have a good confidence that what we are delivering is the actual stress direction for the minimum horizontal stress. And if we are in a vertical well, knowing the minimum horizontal stress direction, 
we can make a very valid assumption that the stress, the maximum horizontal stress direction is perpendicular to it. So once we have one of them, we have the other, we're good to go. Once we start deviating and the deviation starts to increase above 15, 20 degrees, uh, the vertical stress will start affecting these directions. And they start contributing to uh, the general uh, stress uh, di di direction as we are not drilling anymore in the direction in, uh, in the direction of the max of, of the overboarding anymore. So the overboarding will have impact in uh, the directions that we get from breakouts and induced fractures are not actually um, the, the best answer for the stress direction. And for here, when we have a high deviation, we will need to include as many wells as we need to define the stress final di direction answer. In calibers, uh, this is what a possible caliber can read. It can be either reading in gauge if one of the calibers is reading out gauge while the other is reading in gauge, that is our breakouts. Uh, we need to specify, we need to look into those depth by depth because sometimes it's misleading, but most of the time it's very clear that one caliber is reading what is supposed to read while the other is reading way bigger uh, size, then we are in a breakout. And that's again, the direction of the minimum horizontal stress. And if you wanna decide uh, the stress direction, even though this is not very deterministic to me, because as you can see, the direction is, is changing from 10 degrees uh, northeast to 140 to 190. So I would like it to be narrower within 20 degrees range to have a very good confidence. And as you can see, one caliber is reading in gauge while the other caliber is reading out of gauge and the ovality of the rock is not great as you can see. And from here we conclude the direction of the breakout. But it's better than you using breakout from calibers, of course, if applicable and if possible is to use images. On the image, the breakouts happen when the mud, when the mud density is uh, lower uh, and we start having fencile failure. And if we increase the mud density too much, we will frag the formation. That's what we have induced fractures. So when we're looking at image, uh, we will see a very, depending of course on the type of the image, but if this is a resistivity image like an FMI, we will see that the breakouts are, are very wide and they are 90 degrees apart from each other and they're in dark color including that the, the tool is reading a very conductive uh, environment, which is just the mud or that is prevented there. Instead of here, we're reading rock, which is very resistive. Uh, and they're 90 degrees again from 180 degrees from each other. On the other hand, if we have induced fractures due to a high mud weight, then we will read, um, also we'll have a very sharp, very sharp conductive fractures that is in the direction of the maximum horizontal stress. And those two different features, they are 90 degrees apart from each other. So if you see this pattern, then you will be able to determine the stress direction that uh, you have. Here, we're doing the same thing as we did previously, but also we're picking breakouts from ultrasonic image. And as you can see, the breakouts from ultrasonic image is more precise when it comes to the direction. It's from zero to 20 degrees. So now I have very good confidence that, okay, in this case, both, both my breakouts in my image are looking at the same angle. So this is my direction of minimum horizontal stress. Now, if we wanna know, and of course we can make the assumption as we are in a very, uh, very uh, low deviation less than 15 degrees, then okay, if this is my breakout direction, then this is gonna be my maximum horizontal stress direction, which is 90 uh, degrees Northeast. From, for the second part where we can use sonic anisotropy and dispersion analysis, uh, I'm gonna go shortly in this. I know it's, it's a little bit of advanced physics. I don't wanna bother you here uh, with it and it's been an hour already. What the sonic tool measures for a sonic scanner, it measures two uh, shear coming from fluctuating waves. Of those two shears coming overlaying each other, then we are in a formation that has 
the property in all direction, the same exact value. But if we are in an anisotropic formation, one of them will be faster than the other. And for this specific signature, what we call the crossover, this is related to the stress. There's several, several other signatures that characterize different types of anisotropy, but I'm gonna focus only on this for the moment because this helps me know that this formation is, um, is anisotropic for stress reasons. That means it's overstress. And as the sonic scanner and other uh, tools, similar tools, they are oriented tools. So we know the direction of the fast uh, recorded shear. And this fast recorded shear, when we see the signature, it's gonna be in the direction of the maximum horizontal stress. So this is another approach to define the maximum horizontal stress direction in a vertical or subvertical well. We apply some cutoffs. I'm gonna go through this one a little faster than I want to, but so we're on time limitation. Uh, and this is here the publication. If you ever had a chance to read it, it's a very interesting read. And here we can see where we apply those cutoffs and our cutoffs are met. We can get a value for the direction of the maximum horizontal stress that is in agreement with the fast shear azimuth that we just talked about in a second. Now, integrating the data from calibers, images, and sonic scanner will give us very high confidence in our stress directions if we are in vertical and subvertical wells. If we are in deviated wells, we will try to use as many images and many scanner runs and intersect those uh, those solutions to have a unique solution that represents a stress direction in uh, in the region that we're working with. So the, re the, the direction is not going to be well specific, it will be more of a region specific and it has to be validated as we go from one area to another. So my second question to you is, is it difficult to determine stress direction? Please, guys, answer in the chat box. Uh, yes. Yes, great. No. Not okay. difficult, but expensive. Yes, it's very that's, difficult. That, that, that's, uh, okay, that's, that's a good question. Also, <laughs> very expensive. Okay, so this is a photo from the Gulf of Mexico. This is a map from the Gulf of Mexico. And those arrows represent the direction of maximum horizontal stress. Companies working in a complex environment tend to be very generous. They spend a lot of money on science because of the complexity of the environment and how they want to approach the best results. Yet, we have the Gulf of Mexico in evident place to show how difficult it is to determine the direction of the maximum horizontal stress. Look at this one here you see that the direction is ranging from zero to 360. That means it's all directions. And the reason why operators drill around salt domes and the direction of the stress rotates around salt domes. And you have so many of them in this region. That's why we are producing first oil, not gas. If it would be, if it would be there, no, no salt domes, then the, the oil will be cooked because it's on deep water. It will be more turned to gas and it's not that, that's not, uh, very uh, financially suitable for anybody. Well, it costs $50 million to drill here. And, but also that's the biggest challenge. It's because the stress is rotating and they want, and they drill around the salt dome from uh, different uh, angles from the same platform. Uh, I showed you everything in a very straightforward manner, but when you come to reality, you will have difficulties. You will have missing data when you start auditing your work. You'll have, um, you'll have fewer points, you'll have some points that even don't make sense, even though it's core, but it doesn't fall in the same, uh, it, it doesn't fall in the same range that you would expect the property, even with, re even with respect to the other core measurements that were taken. So this is a real example from somewhere in the world. Uh, here we're working with three wells, and our goal is just to do a wellbore stability analysis. I'm gonna walk through this very, very fast as we 
went through those steps previously anyway, but I just want to show you what we're, what we're doing. So for example, we have compressional and shear, and probably you noticed that the compressional and shear are very important inputs for all of our work, for all the elastic properties, for the rock strength, even for the pore pressure, so we will need it. We had uh, mud logs that are in Spanish, and I don't speak Spanish, and neither of my team were speaking Spanish at the time. So we had to Google a lot and uh, figure out what does mud loss mean, and what does port pressure mean, and, and so on, and going through the report page by page. Uh, reports can be like 10 pages, and on the other hand, a colleague of mine spent a month reading reports for a failed drilling operation in a place on the earth that it took a whole year. They would drill, had a problem, stop, stop for a long time, and then come back. And, and But yet, they have a drilling report on a daily basis. Uh, for the core, we have very few cores for UCS and Young modulus, only for two wells. So usually, you are not going to have core in every well. That is, if that's the case, this is the easiest job. But you will have core in some wells, and you will validate to core in other wells, and then you apply to wells where you don't have core. So what we did, we did, um, since we have, the acoustics is missing, but the triple combo is okay and is present. So what we did, we used machine learning to predict the compressional and shear. We used resistivity. We want something that has the same sense as compressional and shear, that is the resistivity that is affected by the intrinsic nature of the beds and so on. So using, uh, using the machine learning, we were able to get that. Another problem we had is very few points. We very have very few points for pore pressure and, um, and uh, the mud weight. So we made the assumption that this was an attempt for an overbalanced type of drilling. And in this case, we would have, uh, we would have our pore pressure is a little lower than the mud weight because the mud weight will be the overbalance. So we need to account for that when we are computing our uh, pore pressure. And we have fewer points of UCS and Poisson's and Young's modulus, as uh, you can see. So our workflow was exactly as I described to you. We start by overboarding computation, then pore pressure uh, after auditing the data, of course. Then we determine the, the properties, uh, the, and then we convert them from dynamic to static. And then we, confine, we define the unconfined compressive strength, the, the, the tensile strength, and also the friction angle. And from there, we go to um, horizontal stress determination. We use more Coulomb to stay on the safe side for the minimum horizontal strengths, and we get the poroelastic model to, the, to have the higher end of the maximum horizontal stress. And finally, we run a wall bore stability, which is not the topic for today. Uh, it is a topic of, I, I hope, for future events and uh, seminars for you guys. Uh, what we did here, we clipped the data. We normalized the data for the machine learning. That's very important. It has nothing to do with geomechanics. We noticed that we have a huge washouts in some of the wells that mean our measurement for, for the damp bulk density is, is impaired and it can be used because it's a, it's a pad type device. We cannot use it when we have unreliable uh, gauges uh, and uh, hole conditions. Uh, this is here, it's not relevant to our work, but I just want to show you that we were trying to reconstruct uh, uh, the compressional and shear. And of course, nothing is perfect. It's not as you, it's nothing is as, as good as an actual measurement. But when you don't have it, you do what you gotta do. You have to come up with the results. Your boss will be uh, expecting results from you even with a very minimum piece of information that he has for you. And we were able using machine learning to uh, obtain an, uh, an acceptable agreement and we train based on one well, and we see how the agreement is between the training data and the prediction data. Once we saw the prediction was acceptable with respect to the training data, we moved on and we apply it to the missing wells. From there, we start with the overboard and estimation. We're trying to keep it very consistent as we're covering the same depth. And we'll try to always be very consistent with your parameters. The same applies for the poor pressure prediction. As you can see, my mud weight is a little 
higher than my pool pressure prediction. That is because I am in uh, overbalance. That's the assumption we made, and we want to always make sure. And uh, please notice that the uh, the, um, the scale is in PPG, and it's not from zero to ten thousand. It's from eight to eighteen PPG. So the difference here is very very small. Then we calibrate our Young's modulus where we have dots. We have it in one well, so we try it to calibrate our Poisson's ratio in Young's modulus is very relatively low. Uh, so it's on the lower end for competent rock. And the same for the UCS as well. We calibrated the UCS in both wells and then applied with an okay confident on the third one. Uh, the friction angle, as I mentioned before, we define our value, what, what we think is our shale. In this, in this case, uh, our shale was 120 GAPI, our sand is at 50 because this was, um, we had a, an active element that is increasing our, our GP, our gamma ray readings in this well. And then we would say, okay, if this is shale at 127, I want the friction angle to be 20. That's a very good assumption. If it's less than 100, if it's more than 127, assign it a value of 18. This is a cutoff. You're clipping the results between 18 if it's a higher than 127 and 38 if it's less than 52. So whatever is less than 52 is assigned the value 38. And then within that range, we're interpolating based on uh, the gamma ray value. But at the end of the day, it would be a lot better if we are using core to calibrate. And then we compute the horizontal stress from both uh, more coulomb and more elastic. Again, we did not have a lot of core missing data or certainty you can tell it is not the best. And, and uh, that's where things stop for us. If we were to say, this is our EMEA. But we took it one step further and we used all those inputs, all those results that we got from the rock strength, from the stresses, and, um, and, uh, and, the, and the friction angle, as you can see, vertical, Young's modulus, we took all those inputs and we run a little more stability and we got these results here. Uh, this is a whole, uh, it will take more than an hour just to go over this, but I just want to show you that we predicted very well, even though we had some uncertainty, we have a lot of uncertainty, we predicted very well where we had a breakout or we had enlargements in the borehole. So whatever you see this thread here, it means we, our mud was lower than it's supposed to be to be on the safe side, and we had some breakouts. That was confirmed in every place for two out of three wells, that when you have uh, breakouts, uh, it was confirmed that we are on the low side. And then we just uh, gave recommendation that uh, to increase the mud weight or have casing in a section where it's supposed to be problematic to keep our well in the safe zone, which is the wide zone in here. Thank you very much for listening. I uh, really appreciate it. I hope you like what you have seen and I hope I introduced something new to you. And uh, thanks a lot for inviting me to this. Thank you so much, Engineer Isa. Uh, we have lots of questions and if you have time, I would like to ask you most of them because I want everyone to have answers. Absolutely. I'll try my best. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. So the very first question is from Farhan. Uh, what is the delta T slowness and why it's important? The delta T slowness is the compressional slowness. It's a property of the formation. So when we are doing a wireline acquisition, we run a tool that is, uh, that is uh, pretty much have a, uh, a source of, the comp of, a, of a wave, uh, of sound wave that propagates into the formation and bounces back and a receiver that is measuring this bounce back uh, wave. It's very important. It's, it's on the same concept of seismic, it's just on a, on a higher resolution. And it's representative of the formation. It has a very good correlation with, with the stiffness, with the compaction of the rock. And um, it's one of, one of the most important ones when you're doing geomechanics. I hope that answers it. Another question, what is the difference between overburden and effective stress? Okay, that's a good question. The overburden is the vertical stress. So that is pretty much the weight of the rock and the fluid that has it. 
The effective stress, on the other hand, is the total stress, which is the, which is the overboarding, minus the poor pressure. So the effective pressure is what we can apply because the poor pressure is already generated by the fluid inside the rock and is confining the rock. Okay. Uh, how do we estimate the poor pressure in sand formations under the we, abnormal pressure? Uh, we, do not uh, we do not estimate it. There is no model for that. Uh, we measure it. We directly measure it using uh, MDT. We use uh, uh, also we use any MDT is a Schlumberger product, but there are several products in the market from other uh, vendors. Uh, the concept is is very basic. You have a pressure transducer device that is installed in the well and in front of a sand formation, and then you just measure the pressure, and that will be your uh, your pore pressure. If you cannot do that, then you will rely heavily on your mud uh, on your drilling reports. So um, why is the dynamic parameters are higher than the static parameters? That's, a, that's another good question. Uh, that's because of um, the static ones are getting, are, are reading from the slope of uh, the elasticity, if I'm not wrong. But the main reason is coming because when you are in a, co in a, in a lab and, and your sample is static, you're applying different pressures and they are, the formation is is expanding and, and, and having strain. That is not, is not uh, accomplished in uh, wireline acquisition. It's uh, pretty much uh, you are applying, you're, you're running a tool that is going way too fast, comparable with, uh, comparable with, a, with, a, with a core lab. And this, the, it's not applying any sort of strain. We're not really cracking the rock or we're not breaking it. So, that's why when we are computing those dynamic measurements, they're mm -hmm. always higher than the static ones. Uh, how much important is the clay volume in the structural analysis of uh, poor hole imaging? I'm sorry, repeat the question, uh, Nihal? Yes, sir. How much important is the clay volume in the structural analysis of the poor hole image logging? Well, uh, you know, the clay is a conductive, uh, conductive uh, it, it is very important. In geomechanics, you know, this is what we cover today is just isotropic, isotropic MEM for the most part. If we want to be very realistic about what we saw, we need to include the shale. It's a, it's a very important player because it has the beddings and the beddings, uh, it has a bedding nature that affect images, affect sonic logs, affect the, the slownesses, affect the stress. Uh, so it's, it's a, the, the, the answer is very important and we have to keep we have to address it. Not addressing shale and the presence of shale and the beddings is underestimating the problem. Okay, so um, someone is asking how can we measure well bore collapse gradient? Well bore collapse gradient. I think that will go, uh, this answer will be in, uh, in the well bore stability. I'm not sure if uh, Dr. Ahmed is planning to have a well bore stability session, but it is, uh, it is, this is the gradient that you're talking about. So here, the breakouts are in the yellow region, but if you, your mud weight is less in the gray area, that will be the collapse region. So this is how we do compute it in your world bore stability analysis. Okay, thank you. So we have like a very specific question, but I would like to ask it. Uh, someone is still having doubt how to determine which direction to drill in the presence of lithological beddings. Um, suppose uh, I drill into a shale formation that has a bedding depth of 30 degrees north to east. In what direction should I have drill? Uh, that's a good question. But here, the bedding is very important. The, the, the direction of the bedding is very important, but also it's what, what is your goal? Are you drilling and then you're gonna frack? Because you, you're always, you, uh, you, you always want, how to put that properly. There's always a favorable direction for fracking based on what you design. So based on that direction of the minimum horizontal stress and the bedding, you will try to make that angle as, you will try to be perpendicular to it most likely, but, but I'm, not, I'm not very sure on this one. I have to look it up. Because 30 degrees specifically, it's, it's a very specific uh, angle. For example, I can give you the Midland Basin, for example, the beddings are either sub uh, horizontal. So when you're drilling, you are 90 degrees to the bedding. And they've been having 
very small issues drilling that way in the vertical section, but when they deviate or when they go horizontal, they start to have a lot of issues. Okay, last question. Um, how can we interpret the elastic properties of two reservoir lithologies? Uh, okay, that's an interesting one. So elastic prop, how can we, uh, no, lithology and well, you can you can you can get a sense of like okay this is a competent rock that means it's a very consolidated rock, or, or you can get a sense of like this is incompetent rock then means it's unconsolidated, but you can be very be very definitive about okay it's going, that this is a sand or this is a dolomite or this sand limestone you really can there is not it's not direct measurement it's a good sense of what the rock could be but it's not a definitive answer. Two different domains yeah. you need. You need your petrophysicist to uh, analog uh, analyze all the well logs, and then we'll give you a very good answer about what the lithology is. Great, thank you so much, and thank you everyone for your questions. We, uh, I promise, we try our best to answer all your questions. It's not, I'm, I'm not all. ignoring anyone, and <laughs> no one is ignoring anyone. So thank you again. We have like lots of people saying thank you for the lecture and they want you back so can well, you like I'm, uh, I, to come back I, I i am definitely honored and uh if um, yeah, we'll take it with dr ahmed offline uh if needs to be anything needs to be done i'm more than happy to be with you guys and i wish you best of luck why offline we you know if you promise you you will yeah <laughs> ahmed, ahmed i promise ahmed i promise okay perfect <laughs> Perfect. Thank, Thank you, you so much. It's my Thank pleasure. You, so you have a good evening. And for you who are fathers, happy Father's Day and happy Father's Day to your fathers as well. It is a Father's Day here in the United States, but I would say the United yeah. States, no one know about it. If it's in the United States, everyone will know about it. You know, yeah. they market themselves very well. That's so. So true. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, to Jason. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, and thank you, everyone on the call. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Good luck, Bye. everyone. Bye. Thank you.